Ćao, dobrodošli u moj Amerika podcast. Ja sam Miroš Panić, a danas po prvi putu gostima imamo Amerikanca. U pitanju je Charles Keter, Amerikanac koji je sasvim slučajno saznao za Srbiju, a kada je došao ovdje, odlučio i da ostane. Razgovor koji sledi će biti isključivo na engleskom jeziku. Uživajte. Charles, welcome. Hey, thank you very much for having me on your wonderful podcast. And I think that the basis of your podcast is phenomenal. More people need to hear this. Yeah, I, I hope so. So, basically, you're like the American living in the Serbia, basically, right now in Novi Sad, Serbia. Mm-hmm. So, before we start your journey with Serbia, I would like to a little bit, uh, I, would, I would like to talk a little bit about your life in the States. How was it look like? Sure. So, you're like 40... Seven yeah, years old. 47. So like yeah. you you've been through the 80s and 90s and 2000s like without like the technology that that we have right now. No. So how was the life in the in the in the in the Illinois because you're from the Illinois right? I'm from Illinois. In the middle middle uh, how do you say the Midwest? Midwest. Yes. Yeah. How was the life yeah. in the Midwest in like the? You know, life in the Midwest. I grew up about three and a half hours south of Chicago, East Central Illinois. My dad is a, he was a huge farmer. He farmed about 1,500 acres, corn, soybeans, wheat. So I grew up in an area where he owned everything around. We had no neighbors. Uh, so I grew up in the woods. I grew up uh, playing around on four-wheelers and things like that. Uh, no cell phones. Um, uh, just very rural I went to a school. We had a school bus, yellow school bus, of course, that picked us up. Uh, and I, the school was about 15 miles away. And it was a small school, maybe 400 people in our school total. Very small, uh, very few minorities. It was very white, uh, farming, hardworking, rural community. Um, and without technology back then, uh, there was more face-to-face interactions, more or less like you see here in the Balkan. People are together. Uh, kids played together. Um, I remember my first uh, my first device to communicate was a pager. If you had a pager, kaksikaji pager na I'm not sure. Like it's that little thing. You, you if somebody called you from their house phone, it would beep, 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 beep. It would give the number, and then you would go to a payphone and call this person. You know. Yeah, I think that we we call that pager as well. Oh, you call it a pager yeah, as well. So. so that was my first technological thing. Uh, I got my driver's license when I was 16. I started working uh, when I was 16. My dad forced me to. He bought me a car. Uh, when I came down on my birthday, he said, here's the keys to your car, but you're not driving until you get a job and pay for your gasoline. Mm-hmm. So I had to work when I was 16. I worked all the way up through college, through the university and everything. Um, and all we did in that little community, it's a tiny community. So for fun, once I had my driver's license, we would get some alcohol, me and my friends, drive through the country. You know, if you see a cow, you get out, you kick the cow, you just do <laughs> silly rednecky type things, you know. So that was kind of life then. Good music, uh, nice, easy, safe environment. You know, I grew up in a small community. Uh, I lived in Chicago years and years later for many years, but I was always a small town kind of guy. Honestly, that sounds very fun. Yeah, oh, it was. It was a blast. Great, great childhood. My mother worked for the U.S. government. She worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She did that for 30 years. My father was a farmer and uh, an entrepreneur. He used to build homes, three or four homes a year, sold them. So I grew up in a hardworking, middle-class, upper-middle-class family. So, yeah, life was good. So you went to the college? I did. What was the name of the college? The name of the college I went to uh, because I left home when I was 17. And that's something that's strange here. I see people still in their 30s that are living with mom and dad. Yeah, My the, parents the, forced me out when I was 17 because they said, hey, you're going to school. You're working full time. I couldn't get public, uh, how do you say it? I couldn't get uh, student loans because my family had money. So I had to pay things on my own. My parents didn't help me. So I moved out when I was 17. I got a job in this factory. Uh, and then I, I uh, financed my education. I went to for, it took me about four years uh, to get through this associate degree program at Lakeland College. It was about 20 miles from home. 
Uh, I studied, I changed my major like six times. It used to be radio and television. I always wanted to do radio. So I started with that. The pay was bad. You know, I saw the career, the future in that was bad. Mm -hmm. Switched to history. Then I switched to management. Then I switched to marketing and I ended up getting my associates in marketing. And then I went to Eastern Illinois University and I did a real estate uh, program. So I received my real estate certificate to sell real estate in Illinois. And then I went to Illinois State University and finished insurance, life and health uh, certification. So I was a life and health salesman. So I did many, many things. <laughs> so how, how was your life in the, in the college? Like, is it like really uh, like the American Pie movie? Like, uh, is it, it, it? It's so similar to that. Yeah, of course. And that's something you don't really see here. You know, everybody would have, you know, on the weekends, they'd have a big a keg of beer. They get a keg of beer. Everybody comes over to the house. You know, you have big parties. People are intoxicated beyond belief at four in the morning. They crawl home. Somehow they get home. Uh, you see that. And another thing that's interesting, like in our high school, uh, it's, it's very similar to what you see on TV. We have groups there like a, uh, how do you say it, social groups. Mm -hmm. I was in, we had like the preppy kids, we called, the kids who dress nice, wealthier kids. We had the athletes, we had the nerds, we had the poor students, you know. So everybody was in a different class. So you didn't typically associate with other classes. You stayed in your little group. And you see that in movies all the time. And so that's very, yeah. very true about America also. So you know? we got a truth spoken here. Like, <laughs> it's really how it, how it looks like in the movies. Yeah, very, very, very similar. Yeah. So shall we start with your Serbian journey? Mm -hmm. Like, so the thing that I know is that you, how did you find the Facebook page? I hate the USA. Like, I think from there, everything starts. Like, how did it you did. find it? It did. And, you know, uh, backing up just slightly, uh, before I found that page, I've been in automobile management for many, many years. I worked for Ford, Lincoln, Mercury, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, General Motors, Cadillac, Pontiac, Buick, all the American car companies. Um, and I found out later, I had a Serbian guy working for me in Chicago. I ran this Pontiac dealership in Chicago. Uh, his last name was, what was that? I can't remember now, but now I know he was a Serbian. At the time, I had no idea. But anyway, I was in my office, this Ford Lincoln Mercury dealership. Every Saturday, I gave a motivational speech because it's our busiest sales day. I'd set the sales guys down and say, guys, come on. We need to sell at least seven or eight cars today. You know, this is the end of the month. Let's go. Let's call our leads. Let's get people in here. Let's make deals. Let's make it happen. After that uh, little spe spiel I gave to my sales guys, one of them came in my office and he's like, Charles, this is when I was new to Facebook. This is Dvehilia Desit. And I said, he said, have you heard about a Facebook page? I hate the USA. We were just chit-chatting. And I said, I hate the USA. Why, why would somebody hate the USA? <laughs> Because I was new to Facebook. And I thought, why would they even create a, gr a group like that? I was a huge American patriot. Midwesterners are very patriotic. So I got on there and I saw this kid named Dragon. As an American, you, you, you think that name is Dragon, mm -hmm. like a Zmai. And there was this other kid and they were making jokes about 9-11 on there. Oh, And I was very offended. And I said, who are you with this weird ass name making fun of this country? You know, we exchanged insults on there, back and forth and back and forth. After about a week and a half of insulting each other, he's like, add me on Skype, here's my Skype. Then I said, sure. So one day after work, added him, we start talking for about two, three hours. Uh, he talked about the bombardment of, you know, 1999 and the 90s, how America supported, you know, all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I knew very little about it. Just the, the American media, there's lots of propaganda in the USA, one-sided, of course. So he opened my eyes a little bit. I was still skeptical because he, he was somebody who hates my country. Uh, so anyway, he invited me to Serbia. This is in January of 2010. He invited me. I had a vacation May 28, 2010 for two weeks. So I told my mother, I said, Mom, can you watch my house? I'm going to Serbia. And she worked for the government for 30 years. She didn't even know about the war. And that's the thing a lot of Serbians don't get. They think Americans hate you. They think Americans had issues with Serbia in the 90s. 95% of our country knows nothing about the wars that we're currently in, I would say. 
It's really sad. Unless you have a member of your family in the war, we're at war everywhere all the time. So nobody even knows. My mom Googled Serbia and she said, oh my God, we had a war with them. They'll probably kill you. I said, yeah, I met somebody on a Facebook page. I hate the USA and I'm going to visit them. And she said, you can't do that. I said, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. So I went by myself, Chicago, France, by myself. In France, I had to get on, at that time, it was Yacht Airlines, uh, the old Serbian uh, Yugoslavian airline. Yeah. I get on that plane. And as soon as I get on that plane, that's when the fear kicked in. And I was like, man, what's going to happen? Maybe they're going to wait at the airport. Maybe they're going to kidnap me. I had all these things running through my head. Fly, land into the airport, met my friends. They were absolutely phenomenal. Big, tall, huge Serbians and a small little Yugo. I come from car dealerships. I've always driven like a big, uh, huge SUV like Americans do. Here, every car was about this big and these guys this tall. I said, how are we fitting in this car? You know, <laughs> so it was very different. It was a really strange situation, you know. So what are your like first, th the shocks that you saw in Serbia when you when you arrived in, a, in a Serbia like in 2010? Uh, well, the, the biggest shocks, I mean, the things that surprised me the most is everything I knew. I remember Bill Clinton coming on TV when we, uh, unfortunately, during 1999, when he started the Operation Merciful Angel, whatever it was called. Uh, and he talked. So you, you get this in your head that this is an extremely dangerous, nationalistic, horrible place. So I expected to be treated like dirt by everybody. When they found out you're an American, I figured they would spit on you and what are you doing here? Get out of here. But that was a total opposite. I saw some of the most hospitable people I've ever seen in my life. We went from Belgrade to Zrenjanin. That's where, that was my first city I lived in in Serbia. I was there for two weeks. We went to Elamir, Echka, all these little villages in Vojvodina, in that obstina of Zrenjanin. Yeah. Went to Subotica, down to Nish and Pirot. Every single home I went to, I would say, hey, where's the hotel? And they're like, what? Stay in my house. USA, we don't do that. If my sister comes to my house, she stays in a hotel. I don't want her in my house. We stay in a hotel and they're like, stay in my house, stay in my I said, why do you guys want me in your house? To me, that's very awkward. But they said, why pay a hotel? You can stay here. And every old grandmother, father who was in the war against my country, even though they disliked my, my government, every one of them said, we don't like your government, but here's food. And there was numerous food, more food than I've ever seen in my life. It looked like they prepared it for a king, you know, and you could never say, hey, I'm full. Oh, no. Yosh, 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 yosh. Drink, 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 drink. Such good hospitality. You know, so it really shocked me how people could dislike my country but treat me like a king, you know. The other thing that I found odd, uh, in the USA, we have a problem with obesity, you know. The huge problem with obesity because everybody eats fast food. Here, we walk through the center of Zrenjanin, small town, you see no extremely overweight people. Everybody's fit. Everybody's beautiful. The women are gorgeous. Tall, that was the other thing. I'm sto sedem deset chest. Almost everybody I saw, these kids in, in high school were like this tall. It's like, man, where are these people? <laughs> they get these genes to be so tall. And the other thing that was remarkable was that everybody spoke English almost, you know. Yes. The kids yes. perfectly because we you know? we we learned English in school like since the since the very first begin since since the beginning of the of the the primary school da we start to I remember I was at this uh, where was I at some coffee shop whatever and I was trying to order something and there was a lady next to me and I said Is any, uh, uh, do you speak English and she's like no and she pointed to her kid kids this big and he said. What do you need? <laughs> I said, can you tell her I want to order a big coffee? <laughs> He said, yes, the perfect English language. The kids here, so smart, you know? Uh, the other thing that was really shocking to me was outdoor cafes everywhere. You have these streets, uh, yeah, where there's just constant outdoor seating in cafes and they're always full. USA, we don't have that. There's no outdoor cafes typically anywhere. And we don't have just a big walking promenade. It's along a street and there's sidewalks, you know. 
And some cities don't even have sidewalks. You have to walk through the grass, you know? Yeah. So that was something that, that I found really nice. And, and, and it was like one in the afternoon, the coffee shops were full. USA, if you go into a bar at one o'clock, there's nobody. They're at work. Here, they're full. Morning, noon, night. <laughs> so those were the biggest shockers, you know, to me. And the other thing was like the, the social aspect of it. When somebody calls you in Serbia and says, hey, let's have a coffee, that doesn't mean let's go grab a quick to-go coffee. It means let's sit here for three hours and just talk, you know? Yeah. And I thought it was beautiful, you know? And it really changed my view of the world. I was brought up in, in, a, in a, the, the, the single greatest capitalistic nation in the history of the world where everything, you're taught up as a child. Like my dad taught me when I was 15, 16, I had to work, work. We have money, but you're gonna work. I'm not giving you money. Work if you want your money. So we're taught to work, 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 work. We work for the weekends. Here in Serbia, the priority is friendships and family and work comes second. And in USA, it's the opposite, you know? So I love that. And I thought, man, I've been living my life working six days a week, 13, 14 hours a day, living for Friday night and Saturday night. And here, people on a Wednesday at two o'clock, they're already in the cafe, you know? To me, it was great. It taught me money isn't everything in life, you know? Yeah. So you came here for like two weeks mm -hmm. and stayed like 14 years. <laughs> and I stayed 14 years, yeah, yeah. Like and, 14 years by now. Yeah, by now. I, after those two weeks, I went back to the USA, went back to my job. I went in, the owner, he comes in, he's like, oh my God, you're still alive after going to Serbia. And I said, oh my God, yes. It's nothing like you see in the media that you know anything about. The Balkans is phenomenal beautiful architecture, which we don't have in the Midwest. Everything is an old, wooden, ugly building. You know, here, gorgeous architecture, you know. And I said, listen, I'm putting in my two-week notice. I'm quitting. I'm going to move to Serbia. Uh, but firstly, I moved to Mexico so I could learn how to stay long-term in Serbia. So I went to Mexico because I can go there for six months as an American with no visa. So I went there. I volunteered in an orphanage. And I studied, how can I stay long-term in Serbia? Because we get 90 days and 180 day period as an American here with no visa, mm -hmm. you know? And I wanted to stay long-term. Try telling that to your mother, a small town government worker that, hey, mom, I'm uprooting my life. I'm moving to Serbia. Your, my mom was like, this is the best country in the world, Charles. Why would you leave? I said, mom, how do you know it's the greatest country in the world? We see it on TV, Charles. Mama, I'm done. I don't need to hear anything more from you. You're listening to propaganda made by the American government. It is a great country to make money. Anybody can succeed. But life is more than that. So I moved here in, what, 2011? Late 2011. And I've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. yeah. So tell me, how did you manage to stay longer? Well, what I used to do, and this is, it wasn't purely legal, but I used to do something called a visa run. So as an American passport holder, I, I don't think the border security uh, was as um, suspicious. So every like 89th day, since I could only stay 90 days, on the 89th day, I would go to a trip into Hungary or into Romania, come right back in, get a stamp for another 90 days. And that's what a lot of people did at that time. Mm -hmm. No questions asked. Uh, maybe if I had a Nigerian passport, they would look, but Americans, they're like, here, you know, another 90 days. You so know, you, used to do you that. didn't have to like stay out of Serbia like for, for a few months, just like... None, no. We went, for instance, Timisoara. Yeah. Me and my friends drove to Timisoara. We went through the border, Serbian border, they stamped it. Romanian border stamped it. We go to Timisoara for maybe two hours, come right back in, stamp, stamp, another 90 days. You know, so I did that for yeah. like five years here. That basically <laughs> sounds illegal, but yeah, it's not apparently, right? No, it, it, it's not because so many, I know so many foreigners who still, uh, well, this, I think things have changed recently. But as of about maybe three, four years ago, there was an Australian lady who's been here for 20 years. And she said, that's what she's done. She's never had a long stay visa. She would just, she said what she did, drive to the Croatian border, park. They knew her. She would walk through the Croatian side, stamp, walk over to the Serbian side, stamp, 
you know, or, or Serbian side stamp, creation side stamp, walk right back in, new stamp, she's good. Four years, yeah. So it showed there was a, there's that loophole, you know, that they never really checked on, obviously. But now I think it's different, you know, yeah. so. Things have changed. Da, 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 da. So when, when we talk about the, your life in Serbia, so you just moved here, did you have like a lot of money with you just to keep you alive, <laughs> not to work? I did. So from like 2011 until 2013, I literally, I worked at Nishta. I did nothing. So how I, did you feel about it? Because in, in in states you would have to like work at least ten hours a day. Of course, like yeah. let, let's like compare it to your like previous life where you have to like work 13, 14 hours a day, live for the weekend. Duh. So how did how did how did it look like for you? How did you feel not to work at all? Well, it was very. I mean, it was like what did you do? It like, was all strange day? because I used to just work, you know, and then I come here and I kept myself busy. I was a very popular guy, uh, so every city I lived in small cities like Zrenjanin. Every single person knew me in Zrenjanin. So I would walk through Zrenjanin. Hey, Charles, hey, let's have a beer. Hey, Charles, come to my house tonight. Hey, Charles, come to my Slava, come to my Rojendan. So I was constantly busy socializing with people. I volunteered also in some schools in Zrenjanin. Uh, I just went in and said, hey, is there a way I can help? And they're like, yes. Yeah. So I, I helped at Gymnasia, uh, Nikola Tesla, the Nikola Tesla school also. Uh, they would allow me to come into the English class and just like do conversational English with the students. So I kept myself busy with that. I worked at a couple private language schools there uh, with little kids, smartest little kids you'll ever see. Uh, so I did that. I traveled around all over Serbia. At that time, I lived in Zrenjanin. Then I moved from Zrenjanin down to Nish, and then Nish to Sremska Mitrovica, Sremska Mitrovica to Panchevo, Panchevo to Nova Galenica, Nova Galenica to Kotej. And then I ended up here in Novi Sad, what? I think it's been eight, nine years I've been right here in this city. So I kept myself busy traveling. I had a lot of money because I used to make a lot as a sales manager. I mean, back in the, back in the early 2000s, the automobile industry was very pro uh, profitable. I, I have no wife, no kids. All my money's mine. I saved it. I invested it. So I had so much money, I couldn't even spend all that money. You know, At that time you could find in Zrenjanin beautiful new apartments similar to this size for like $150. My Struja, Infostan, Sve was like maybe $30. You know, So then I would go out every night, eat out. I never cooked and I couldn't even spend like $1,000 a month. Back then things were cheap and good, yeah. you know? So now, now it's now now it got a little bit expensive, oh. yeah. But yeah. I had a conversation with my manager back in in the Block Island uh, like last year. So he asked me like, "How's life in Serbia?" I was like, "You can like pretty much live with a thousand dollars a month." He was like, "What? Like no way! <laughs> like that's like twelve hundred twelve thousand dollars a year." I was like, "Yeah, like we need here like at least like forty fifty thousand dollars just to live, like you know, like normally uh, to live or like whatever." Uh, uh. So they were like shocked, like for that. I was like, "Yeah, like a thousand dollars, like you you could live fine in Serbia, like no no worries." I was like, "Man, like finish the season, and then like go to Serbia and like live in Serbia up until like the, like the May and like go back to the, to the, to the island." And, That's like, what I do typically. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's perfect. Yeah. You see that. I think the poverty rate, uh, when they look at the poverty poverty rate in the USA, I think it's considered, what is it, uh, $15,000 or more or less, you're considered poverty. But here, with that money, you can come here and you can live nicely. Of course, you'd have to be conservative anymore because the prices of food and everything have gone up, you know, yeah. exorbitantly over the last, you know, couple years especially. Since after corona, things yeah. have creeped up. You know, especially like the the, the apartments and the, the the meat and the food went like skyrocket. Da da da, so true. So your life in the Zrenjanin, how was it like? My, if, I mean, like the, because the Zrenjanin is like the the in the in the part of the Vojvodina which is Banat. Da. And like, how was it for you? Like, if you compare that for your, your like the American life. I mean, it was very easy. And, and, and the other thing I wanted to mention earlier, you know, prior to Serbia, my life was stressful. I worked six days a week, 14 hours a day. I was in charge of a big group of salespeople. We have certain sales um, numbers we need to hit each month or the owner is on my ass. 
Uh, pardon my language. Uh, he's on my ass. Hey, you only sold 50 cars. What's going on? We need to pay the bills. Get on this. Very stressful. I come here, total opposite. Everything is here is just the way I said uh, that I like to describe Serbia in a whole. If I had one word to describe Serbia, it would be opuštena. It's just relax. I went into a, a coffee shop in Zrenjanin. And I said, uh, molim vas velika kafa zaponiti. And she said, ne velika, mala, and sit. I said, I have <laughs> yeah. to sit down and drink a coffee? Americans like to go to Starbucks, get a big one this big, walk around, drink it, drive, drink it. Here it's sit down, relax, smoke a cigarette, whatever. And I loved it. So I was on high doses. I, I struggle with ADHD. I was diagnosed ADHD, which stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which here in Serbia, they think it's a fictitious American disorder. Uh, but I was on high doses of Adderall, which is a stimulant. When I moved to Serbia, I quit taking it cold turkey. Stop totally. I'm still slightly odd. I talk a lot. I move my hands a lot. But it told me I didn't need that medication, you know. So Serbia has been very beneficial for my life. I'm a lot more calm, patient than I used to be. So it's good for my heart, my blood pressure, <laughs> and everything here. You know, so my days consisted of every day going to the cafe in the morning. I wrote a blog about Serbia called Serbia Through American Eyes. I started making videos about Serbia. That's how I kept myself occupied about the food, the culture, because this country is very misunderstood. Most people don't know it exists. They think it's Siberia. They think it's Syria. Yeah. They know nothing about you. And so I wanted to make videos to show that this country is great. There's lots of benefits here, you know. And so I started that in 2010. And to this day, I have about 1,100 videos strictly about Serbian lifestyle, you know, villages, foods, culture, things such as that. Did you manage to change some Americans like to come and uh, like see Serbia? Numerous, no? da, yeah. da. And not just American people. Almost every day, back when I was making them on a daily basis, I used to upload a video every single day just about random life in Zrenjan and what I did, etc. And every day somebody would message me and say, hey, we're Turkish. We heard Serbians dislike Muslims and Turks. And I said, listen, I'm an American. My country bombed this country, unfortunately, in 1999. And there's no hatred here. These are the most accepting people. Of course, there's a small percentage of every population who's extremely ultra-nationalist and hate everything. Same in the USA. But here, the vast majority are interested. I said, they're going to be interested in you. People ask me that all the time. They said, you're an American. Why would you come here? <laughs> you know, why would you come to this country? So I convinced numerous people. This a great example, that Turkish guy. He listened to me, came here on a one week. He said he extended into a month. He brought five more of his friends to Serbia. And now they come every single year to Serbia. You know, it's their getaway place. Uh, and numerous Americans also. I get Americans every day who message, hey, I want to open a call center in Serbia. I want uh, to open this in Serbia. My wife is uh, Serbian and she wants me to come to Serbia, but I'm kind of nervous if I'll fit in. Cultural things, what do I not do? What do I not talk about? Da, da, da. So I've been a huge ambassador, not patting myself on the back, but I spent so much of my free time just answering questions. I help people find apartments for free. Uh, you know, I helped hook them up with a lawyer for free, some a CP, uh, an accountant. Uh, I've done so many things for these people for little to nothing, just to be a good human being, a good citizen of Serbia. <laughs> so you're basically like Serbia's favorite American. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah, duh. There's I was not say, many other options, probably. <laughs> yeah. So after that, you moved to Novi Sad. So in, in between, did you go back to the States or just like live two years in Serbia? I did not. I was here from 2013, or sorry, 2011 until I went back to the USA in 2014. So I was away for about three years. So how was your trip back home? Like now you have like the, the opposite 
culture shock where you have, you know, you lived in Serbia, which is like quite different than the States. And then you go back to the States and you see yeah. like, you know, how was it for you? I mean, it was a big adjustment, you know, I mean, because everything is so much different in the USA, so much faster paced, you know. Uh, so yes, that was definitely a struggle. And that's a struggle that I still with deal with to this day. When you're an expat, I mean, I'm a citizen now of Serbia also, but I still consider, I'm still not totally fully accepted as a Serbian. Um, in the USA, if you're from China and you get an American citizenship, people call you an American. Here, I, I'll call myself a Serbian and people say, you're not a, you're not a Serbian, you're an American with our passport. USA, it's different. We look at everybody. We're a country of many different makes and models, if you will. And they're considered an American. Here, it's about, oh, you got to be Pravoslavats uh, or you're not a Serbian, you know, that. So anyway, it was, a, it was a big adjustment and it still is to this day. I'm not fully accepted by most here. And then when I go home, it's the same. It's an odd feeling. I enjoy it for a couple weeks and then it's like, my God, I miss the Balkans so much. You know, so you struggle with that. That's a big problem for people who've moved out of their comfort zone, you know. Yeah, but you you lived with uh, with the Balkan people like in the last many years because the, you, were, you, you were like living the, like the perfect life, life because uh, in the winter you live in Serbia and then like in the April, May, you move to the States, go to the Nantucket, yeah. live the summer there, like, you know, get a lot of money and like move to Serbia back and, you know, enjoy. So, um When did you start to work with a work and travel group company? I started with the, the way I first heard about summer work and travel. I'd never heard of the that government program. Not at all? Uh, never heard of it. No, no nishta about it. I'm from the Midwest and I was dealing in automobile industry. And so I knew nothing about this program that it existed. So this One is like, day, it's, it's quite popular here in the, in the region. Oh, extremely popular now. Yeah. Like everybody wants to go to the States. Everybody. And, and when I first heard about it, I was in the newspaper. I think it was in Blitz or something. The owner of Work and Travel Group, he saw the article. He reached out to me. He said, hey, at Saba Center in Belgrade, we're going to have about 800 students for a prepping for their trip, upcoming trip to the USA on a, on a government a sponsored program called Summer Work and Travel that allows a foreign university student to live and work in the USA during their summer break in Ugostitetsko, or however you say that word, hospitality, yeah, hospitality yeah. strictly. So I heard about it. I researched it. I was like, wow, what an amazing program for these people. You know, so I agreed. I went and spoke in front of those 800 people. I did a phenomenal job, of course. And at the end, he's like, I would love to hire you to work for this company. I think it would be great. You could go to the universities, give presentations, talk to the students about different locations. What's better about, let's say, the West Coast as opposed to Central USA or Alaska or East Coast, etc. So I agreed to do it. So I started a work and travel group. I believe it was 2014 uh, was my first year working there. And I'm still part of work and travel group, you know. And I think the program, when you when you talk about the program, the American government, it's one of the, there's a lot of programs and things they have out there that are not good. But this one to me uh, is totally flawless. It's one of the best possible things any student could ever do. It gets you out of your comfort zone. It, 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 it lets you uh, interact and befriend people from other nationalities because you're not just with Americans. You're with Croatians, Albanians, Greeks, uh, Chinese people, Vietnamese, etc. So you're getting a bro you're broadening, broadening your mind and you're learning a little bit about American people. And that's that's the thing that's lacking here between Serbia and the USA. Very little interaction between people. When you find out, you speak to some random American about Serbia, they don't know about the war, most of them. They're like, where, Serbia? You tell them about Serbia, they don't know it. You know, So this is a way to bring people together, totally life-changing. So for me, When you look at the benefits work and travel has has had on me, for instance, my two best friends in the whole world, Uroš Milic from Kalujarica, Belgrade, if it wasn't for work and travel, I never would have met him. Darko Stojilkovic, I bumped into him in some random coffee shop in Nantucket. He was working. I saw his name tag and said, Darko. And I said, hey, Darko, desi vrati moj, odakle ste? And he said, 
uh, Pojarevac. And I said, oh, but I said, let's have a coffee. I don't know who you are. He wasn't through with my agency. Now we're best friends. He lives in Los Angeles. I visit him and his girlfriend every year. And if it wasn't for this program, I wouldn't have had those friendships. And also with Croats also, something I pride myself in, usually like Nantucket, I like to diversify each employer. So when an employer tells me, Charles, I need 10 students, I like to pick a couple Greek students, a couple Croats, a couple Serbs. And then when you tell that Croat from Zagreb, I say, hey, buddy, listen, here's your housing. You're going to be living with two Serbs from Belgrade, two of these. And they're like, Serbians. Oh, my God. I don't know if I can handle it. You tell the Serbian the same thing. Hey, Belgrade kid, you're going to be living with a couple Croats from Zagreb. Oh, my God. It's awkward for the first couple days. Into the summer, they're like brothers. We still all, almost every year's students that I've been there, we have like reunions. We're all together. They're invited to each other's weddings. It brings, it breaks the stereotypes that the Serbs and the Croats have against each other, you know, and also against America, you know. So yeah. that's what I think is great about the program personally. So like, when did you start to go to the Nantucket and like live in the Nantucket and Serbia and then move like back and forth? I think that was the year 2014, actually, mm -hmm. because what I do uh, at the pro uh, at, at Work and Travel Group, I'm one of the program managers. I deal in housing because a lot of the employers on the program do not provide housing. So I seek out housing. I make sure it's safe. I do a background check on the landlord to make sure they're not a criminal, a sex offender, or whatnot. I make sure that it's affordable for the student because a student can't pay $800, $1,000 a month and make money. So I make sure I negotiate it. I get an Uber go for for the student. I make sure it's safe. It's close to their job, etc. cetera. Um, and what else? So when, and I also make each student uh, who wants to apply for my positions, because I know many business owners and they trust me to find quality students. So I make each student make a short video of themselves. One minute, Hey, my name is Milos. I'm from Novi Sad, Serbia. I study at the Faculty of Technical Science. I'm in my third year. I have a lot of great work experience in hospitality. I would love to work for your company. I make them do that. And I interviewed a lot of the students. So the owner of the Nantucket Bike Shop, he saw the video and he said, hey, I don't really like that Serbian kid, but I like you. You're good. I want you to work for me. Never even considered it. And I'm like, Yeah, sure. Might break up the monotony of living in the Balkan year round. So I accepted the position. I went there with some, at that, that time it was nothing but Serbians, 11 Serbian students. We all lived together in the same house. Uh, so even though I wasn't in Serbia, I was still surrounded by Serbians, you know, and, on Nantucket. So that's when I first started going, 2014. And I've gone ever since, you know. This will be the first year that I do not go uh, to Nantucket. So it'll be a little strange for me. Right now, um, I, I saw like a lot of comments and like a huge hate for the for the American programs here, especially the work and travel, because there's like a lot of people that say that the Serbian people, let's say that, let's say, uh, let's use the Serbian as, as an example, that Serbians are the slaves yeah. on the work and travel in, 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 in the United States. I mean, like here you can like work for like few, few dollars an hour. But like, let's say I was like working last year for like $18 an hour. That's basically uh, how much somebody can earn in a day working in Serbia. So what are your thoughts about it? No, I, I think it's ludicrous. Those folks who typically criticize this program, uh, I think those folks are the ones who are jealous, who've never experienced it, who cannot qualify for this program. And I've asked students, you talk to any student who's been on this program, and the I would say 90, I mean, this is just a random number, but I would say 98% of the students who've been on this program, it's, it's changed their lives for the better, you know. There are students, of course, that are working like slaves, if you will, but voluntarily because they don't want to work one job. They want to work two or three or four. My boys in Nantucket, every student I have in Nantucket, they're working maybe a hundred-ish hours a week, but they don't have to. They could work one job and work 40 hours a week and get treated decently. I think the American business owner, no disrespect to Serbia, to the Balkan bosses, but American bosses treat you with more respect, in my opinion, 
There's the ability to kakusikaje, um, to move up in a company. Uh, we have a lot of students who start out as a dishwasher. Then they end up becoming a server. You work hard. You show you're a good worker. You can advance in the company. Here in Serbia, I, I don't think you see that. I don't think they appreciate that. Like every, uh, everybody puts like on the on the job offer. Like everybody puts like you you can like uh, how do you say um, when you wanna when you have a chance to to level up. Let's say yeah. so. In theory, you can level up in Serbia, but in, in, in like in the real life, like so hard. But in the Reza, States, yeah, yeah. But I saw that the examples in the States, like for example, I was like working as a dishwasher my first time because they didn't know Did the English very well. <laughs> but then I like learned it, learned it in the in the States, and then I, like I was like working several other jobs that required like speaking with the people. You know, like I was like working as a barista, making the to go coffee, and I had to talk with the people. That's what I that's what I wanted because I wanted to improve it, improve my English. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I agree. And, and I think, you know, also like those students of mine who go to Nantucket, May 21st to the end of September, those students who were, they were so aggressive with work. Some of them had never worked a day of their life here in Serbia because you don't see the same thing. That's another difference between the USA. I worked when I was 15. I worked all, full time all through university, college, etc. Here in Serbia, a lot of these students, when I interview them for a position, I'll say, tell me about your previous work experience. Uh, I've never had a job. What? You tell an American business owner, this, this 22 year old student has never worked before. They're like, what? We've been working since we're 15, you know. Uh, but here I know it's difficult for them to find jobs. But anyway, those boys in Nantucket, they they work 40 hours a week at one job. Their days off, they do landscaping. They pick up a night job three hours a week as, as security. So they're working over 100 hours a week. They invest in this program maybe whatever the program fee was, 1700 US dollars plus their flight plus a little bit of money to bring with them. So let's say $2,000, $2,500, let's say, maybe. Uh, I would say it's, it's close to like $3,500. Okay, probably. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, maybe a better, you, you know more about it than me. I don't pay yeah. it. Uh, anyway, they come back on this program four months later, the vast majority of my Nantucket boys with twenty-five to $30,000. What, what kind of investment can I, as an American, put 3500 in in May and in October have $30,000? I would do it all day long. This is a program. You work however much you want to work. You know, that's it. It's not slavery in any way, shape, or form, you know. So that stuff is total, utter nonsense, you know. Yeah, so I I had like a lot of hates. I received a lot of hate like in the previous months because you know there, there's like a lot of like you know hates for the USA in Serbia. Unfortunately, yeah, of course. I mean, like yeah. it happened. What happened? To be honest, yeah. but yeah. It, it, it it it's it is how it is. But you know, like we have to <clears throat> let's say you know uh, strengthen our like uh, connection so we can like you know have a better future. Of course. Better future for you and your children. Of course, what's happened in the past was it, it was horrible, uncalled for, but that's the way of the world. Uh, America is at war uh, constantly around the world. Superpowers, that's what they do, you know. There's nothing I can do about it. I experience hate to this day. Every day I open my Facebook, somebody says, oh, America, get out of this country. Now, of course, it, I understand it. He's never left this country, this person. He doesn't know me as a person. I'm sympathetic. I'm willing to sit down with somebody who hates my government and listen to them. I'm sympathetic for what happened. But don't judge me and don't judge all of the Americans. You know, we're not going to judge you for what Slobodan Milosevic did or, or whomever. You know, it's silly. Judge the person themselves, you know, the way I see it. Yeah. Also, there's one thing that I, that I, um, that's how I saw you first time is like your YouTube channel that you has, that you said that you had like a lot of views, like a, th a thousand views, uh, th oh, sorry, a thousand videos. videos. Yeah. So tell me more about it. Uh, I started making those videos. Reason being, I'm somebody who travels frequently. You know, my, my passion in life, my number one goal in life is to visit every single country. 
So before I travel to a country, I like to go to YouTube. I like to look up real scenarios of people who've been there, their experiences. When I looked up Serbia before coming here, there was very little information that you could find except negativity. You know, it's not just America that has this view on Serbia, unfortunately. The whole world, there's a stigma attached to Serbia, unfortunately, because of the wars. You know, so people are like, oh, Serbia is this, Serbia is that, the Balkan, this nonsensical stuff that you're backwards, internet's not here, you're not, you don't have automobiles, all this nonsensical things you would hear. I, I looked it up, I found very few. I came here, loved it, and so I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna start making some videos and sharing them just for my friends to show respect, how good the people are. The people here are better people than our people, I think, with foreigners. We treat foreigners a little bit standoffishly in the USA. We're still kind and fake, hey, how are you? But still, we don't have that hospitality. We wouldn't say, hey, come to our house, you know, because that's rare, that would be weird. Uh, but here you do it. So I started making videos about life in villages in Sremska Mitrovica and Zrenjana and in Nish and Pirot and the food and the people and the religion and the festivals like Chvarkiara and uh, Kaksazove, uh, all these different festivals, just to broadcast the good things about Serbia. You know, when it grew and grew, I think I have like now 57,000 subscribers. But over the last, I did that until... I received citizenship in 2020. I almost stopped from that point. Reason being negativity. There's so much negativity. Me as an American talking about your country. So many people are like, oh, get out of this country, go home, da, 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 this. And it gets to you after a while. It shouldn't, but it does. And I'm like, I'm 47. I don't need that exposure anymore. I'm not interested in listening to negative thoughts and fools out there, so I slowed down considerably. I would like to get back into it, but you know, it's just dealing with that negative thing. It takes the right frame of mind to be able to put those negative thoughts out, you know. Yeah, I used to like watch your videos, like especially f when you go to the States and like, you know, film the, like, you know, you in the Boston and the Hannahs and like the Nantucket and you like show the streets and show how it is in the real life. Mm -hmm. That's like, I enjoyed it in like in that, like so much. So yeah. like come back as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I should do that more, you know, but the thing is also with that, you know, when I look at my channel and the views, it, it's, it's really funny because most of the views are from Serbia and they will watch a video about a Plieskovica or Sarma or Piktia and all of that stuff. They'll watch those more than they do about other uh, like American travel and things like that, typically with me. You know, Serbians, it seems like are, uh, so many of them are, they want to hear so much about a foreigner's impressions on their own country. Yeah, that's you know? true. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a huge truth. Yeah. Me, for instance, as an American, people will send me a video of some foreigner in the USA. I could care less what that person thinks of my country. I'm not interested in it. I don't care if they like our fast food, if they like our city. It, it, it means nishta to me. You know, I don't care. But here, people love to hear people talk about Serbia. Maybe because you're a small country. Maybe that gives them pride, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so it's it's very interesting just to see, like, somebody as an American experiencing the Serbia. So, like, let's see, how is somebody, like, you know, who grew up in, like, different conditions and, like, you know, had a different life than we here have in Serbia. So, so okay, let's see how somebody experiences, so, let's say, like, some events, like, you know, here in Vojvodina, you said, like, the Čvarkijada and, like, some, some other stuff, yeah, yeah you know, like, you, you want to see, like, how, how will somebody, like, react to see all of these things, because no. it's quite different. You don't do that in, you don't, you don't do that back in the, in yeah, the States. Very rare, yeah. No. Yeah, there was, I think, that I saw the video, there was, like, the, there is somebody, I think, in the, in the, in the, Indiana, there's, like, a guy that makes, you know, the slanina, you know, the bacon and everything, like, the Serbian way, or, or the Balkan yeah. way, yeah. So, he has, like, a lot of, like, this mostly Serbian Balkan people from the Chicago coming up to his house and, like, you know, buying yeah. the, you know, like... I'll have to check food. it out. Yeah. Which city in Indiana, do you know? I'm not sure, to be honest. There's a lot of Serbians, like, in, in Merrillville, which is on the northern, sub, more or less suburb of Chicago. It's growing so honestly, fast. Honestly, I think, like, it's going to be, like... Um, 
It's not that far from the from the from the Chicago. It's like oh, really? in the Indiana. Yeah. So yeah, must They're, be northern Indiana. Yeah, a lot of Serbians there. Yeah, I think they have Sveti Sava uh, Crkva in Merrillville, a big Serbian community, in Merrillville, Indiana. Probably somewhere over there. I'll have to check it out. So, what do you think about the Serbians living like, let's say, more likely? What do you, what do you think about the Balkan people living in the in the states, especially like the Chicago area? And then, like the Serbian people living here, like how do you, are like are they like really like different people? You know, I think they are different people. And 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 one way I would uh, a good way to there. Firstly, if we talk about success, we the United States is a country of immigrants, and when you look at the Balkan folks who are in the USA, so many successful people. Because they come from here where salaries are very low. They go there, they find out, man, if I work hard, I do this, I can make so much more money. So there's so many successful doctors, lawyers, uh, uh, trucking company owners. Just in Chicago alone, they say what? Trista Hiliada Serba there. Yeah. Uh, and they said over what was it? I, a number I heard here off the top of my head, maybe 300 alone, maybe more big trucking companies are owned by Serbians. You know, a lot of Serbians that move there, they end up being a driver of a camion. They save money, they buy their own, they buy another and another and another. So they're really benefiting the USA. The other thing I see about the diaspora is they're so patriotic. They're the ones that are flying the Serbian flags in their homes. Uh, and in this country, you don't see that, you know. And that's something I think is, uh, I think it's a shame. You know, I think you should be extremely proud uh, of showing where you're from and your country to the world. It's your piece of this planet, you know. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of places here, you walk down the street. I mean, I walked, I lived by the Zelenska uh, Stanica. I walked down here about a mile. I don't think I saw one home that had a Serbian flag flying out in front of it. USA, you walk a mile in any city, you're going to see probably a thousand flags. Everybody's got a flag, you know, and, and, and people say that's fake patriotism, but I disagree. I think you should be extremely proud. And I see American or Serbian diaspora in the USA being very proud. Many of them follow me. Many of them know me. Many of me, many of them have helped me. Every time I go to a city, for instance, I'm going to Mississippi, probably the, it's the the poorest state, the fattest state. It's number one in all the negative categories. I just randomly wanted to go there for seven days here on the 30th of March. And there's a Serbian there. He's like, hey, I live in Mississippi. I'd love to meet you. Everywhere I go in the world, Kenya, I was in Kenya. There was a Serbian message me. Hey, I live in Kenya. Let's wow. see each other. I went to Somalia. There was a Serbian. Hey, let's meet up. Serbians are all over the globe and they're all very passionate. They like to see what's happening in Serbia. Uh, but the other thing that I see, the negative part of that is a lot of uh, ridiculous patriotism. When they see what's happening in Serbia, they're like, oh, you know, this shouldn't be happening, you know, this, they should do this, this, this. And I always say, hey, move here. You know, people criticize me. Why are you living in my country, this, this, this? I said, hey, I live here year round. I have a right to talk about whatever I want. Yasam Serbin, I have your passport. You live in the USA. Why don't you come here and vote and make this country whatever you want it to be? Don't tell me what to do. So they're like, from a distance, oh, Serbian should do this, 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 this. Eh, silly, you know. Get your ass over here mm -hmm. and you do that. Exactly. You know? So that's the way I see them, you know. So we have like a huge diaspora basically in Chicago. I would say like uh, a lot of Serbian people. So unfortunately, we have that issue with working travel program as when you go to the States for the very first time, you will you will receive uh, legally, obviously, uh, the social security number, which will allow you to work legally. Mm -hmm. And there's like the one thing that Serbian people do uh, every single year. Like, I mean, like, uh, the USA is basically, as you said, like the immigrant country, like everybody like around the world know about this, uh, the USA and like everybody pretty much wants to move or like travel to the States. Yeah. And there's like a huge problem with Serbia is here's like situation with um, with like jobs and you know, salaries and whatever. It's, it's, it's fine. Let's say let's say that that way, like it's fine. But a lot of people like use the work and travel to go to the USA and state illegally. So oh, yeah. let me tell you, like, what Huge are your problem. thoughts about it? Uh, well, I, I, I think it's, 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 
I'm sorry, it's it's a it, quite rough topic. So. It, it, it is a rough topic because I like to put, I, I come from, I, I have two viewpoints on that. For instance, if I was born here in this country as a smart young person who's studying, let's say, medicine, and I see here in the here in Serbia, a doctor's going to make, let's say, hiljera dinara, dve hiljera euro, whatever, a month. He sees in the USA they're making a million dollars a year. It's tough here to get a job. Veza is very important here, unfortunately, unfortunately still yes. to this day. Yeah. USA, it's not. I mean, there's still, of course, you have that everywhere. But if your qualifications is what they look at more so in the USA than they do in this country, I think. So if I was a Serbian, a bright, young Serbian, I go to the USA on a four-month program, I make 30000 in four months, and then I think, okay, tomorrow I got to fly back to Serbia and work for 500 euros a month, I might stay also, mm -hmm. you know. As an American... It's, it's horrible. We've got a massive issue with illegals, especially with this administration that's currently in power. They're allowing millions upon millions to enter the country illegally that's zapping our resources, our money. Our, uh, the city of New York has given them like $2,500 cards and free housing. They're not doing that to the homeless people. And the other, the biggest issue about that is that hurts the next student who wants to go on the program the next year. When the U.S. Embassy sees uh, 200 students stay illegally, the U.S. Embassy, for the next year students who apply at the embassy, they're going to be harder on you. Yeah. Are you going to return from this program? You know, what are you going to do? They're going to deny a lot more students. So it's devastating for the program that the students do that. So I, I, I can see it both ways, but as an American, I, I, I hate it. I, I don't like illegal folks in, in, in our country, you know, but I can see the Serbians' uh, point of doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at Serbians as opposed to the Croatians, you know, we had very, we have offices, a couple offices in Serbia, two of them in Croatia, one in Bosnia Herzegovina, one in, two in Greece. The biggest overstays are from Serbia. Yeah. Croatians, I think we had one overstay in two years. That's it. Because they're part of the European Union, it's easier for them, of course. Yeah. You're not. So I think a lot of these students, once they actually get their visa for the first time, they get there and they think, ooh, if I go back and apply again, I'll probably be denied, so I'm going to stay here. And it's so easy to be illegal in the USA. There's no repercussions, you know. Unless you commit a major crime and you go to court, then they can deport you. But if you're not, the local police are going to stop you. They're not going to say a word because there's different levels of the police. They don't care, you know. So basically, it's, like it's if, the, if the police stops you on the streets, like they will not look for your passport. If no. you have like the ID, like let's They're say not you have like say a word, you know. So like you Inter are illegal in the states, but nobody knows that. Yeah, nobody knows they until you like make the, some huge mistake. Huge you know, mistake, like, and you go to court, yeah. and then they find out, and then they can do a deportation order. You know, it's happened a few times with some Serbians on Nantucket. They were driving intoxicated, had a wreck. They were deported back here to uh, Serbia, but the vast majority, I know, probably <clears throat> on Nantucket Island alone, there's probably twenty. 20 or so illegal Serbians that I'm even aware of. And that's a small island. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. like, yeah. It's sad. Yeah. So I just wanted to also ask you about, um, if we say the police, uh, what's about the border police? What about the immigration police? Like, can they, like, look for you? Is it, like, did it happen, let's say, on the Nantucket or, like, in, in the places that you know that the police came, like, on the... On the purpose, just to catch catch up some people and deport them. Like, is it is it like the the real thing that because it happens like here in in Europe? I think so. If you, let's yeah, say it should. Yeah. So let's say I think if you uh, work in Germany illegally on like some field or whatever, there is a police that a special police that's gonna look for you and check your passport, check your you know visa and whatever. So. Yeah. Is it like reality in this in the in the USA or not? Like, can somebody, some some special police, look for you and like ask you for the passports? So some proof of that, uh, yeah. So of your like, some, legal yeah, status, yeah. you know, it, it it is. But the problem we have now in the USA, there's what's called sanctuary cities, and the the branch of police that enforces immigration status is called ICE, Immigration and Custom Enforcement. So you have a lot of these mega cities ran by the liberals, New York, Chicago, 
Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, they will not allow ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is a federal government program, police, they will not allow them into the city to prosecute. So that's why you see all these illegals in these massive big cities, because they're safe. They can live there, they can work there, they can do whatever they want with no repercussions. Two years ago, I believe it was, uh, or maybe it was under when, when, when President Trump was in power, uh, there was, I was, I was reached, this is like in maybe, let's say, December of, let's say, 20, uh, 2019, maybe. I received a message from a landlord of mine in Hyannis. She, she had ten, uh, five or ten Serbian students in her home. She left me a voice message in December, which is kind of odd. And she said, Charles, immigration showed up at our door looking for a Zoran, I'm not going to say his name, but anyway, Zoran and this other guy. And I was like, really? And she said, yeah, this is the first time this has ever happened. And she said, do you know where they are? And I said, no, I have no clue, you know. Mm -hmm. So it does happen. But what will also happen, especially on, a, on an island like Nantucket, the, the, these business owners, they rely on student workers. The local people are rich. They're not going to work as a conobot or as a, in, these, in these hospitality jobs. It's beneath them. That's why they, re, they rely on you and they rely on illegals to build things and to cut their grass and do their lawn, etc. Uh, so they're aware of it. And I've heard rumors that there's even... Um, um, how do you, how do you say it? Um, they've been tipped off that immigration will be coming there. And so then they send the people home uh -huh, okay. and things like that. That still goes on here or, or there, you know, similar to here. Cause I've heard here in Serbia, like businesses who, uh, uh, have maybe not registered employees, They'll send those uh, inspectors from Belgrade, and one of them will call a business owner. Then all the business owners call each other in Serbia. Hey, yeah. send your illegals, uh, send your illegal workers home. <laughs> so similar things happen in the USA, you know. So also, what what happens here is basically if uh, how how to say the the these guys that, that come come up to you to, to check up on inspector, yeah. or whatever. So yeah. If the if you see the the inspector coming, or if if the inspector showed up on your place, let's say if you have a store and you have some like, illegal things working in there, so you'll basically bribe them and oh, you'll, you'll be fine, you know, like two or three hundred dollars, <laughs> euros, yeah. whatever, and that that's you know, uh, yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's how it is yeah. in Serbia. That that's that's uh, no, unfortunately no. true. Da 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 da. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So one thing. Um, that's quite interesting about you is that you received your passport in two, uh, 2020, right? Mm -hmm. when, when, when was the COVID? June 6th of 2020. Yeah. So I just want to hear all of the stories about it. Like what, what happened and how did you get it and how do you feel about it? And what, what are the some, uh, let's say, some challenges that you, that you had um, <clears throat> when you see, received the password? I mean, like you, have, you had to like register for the for the national ID, right? And whatever the paperwork, how was it? How was it for you? You know, for me, it, it, firstly, it was one of the biggest honors of my entire life uh, to receive citizenship. I'm the only person in my family's history to have dual citizenship. I waited to tell my mother until I had it in my hand. I took a picture. I said, mom, I'm I didn't want to tell her in advance because she worked for the government. I said, mom, I'm currently a valid, uh, an official Serbian citizen. And she said, oh my God, you didn't give up your American citizenship for that, did you? I said, no, mom, we can have dual citizenship. You know, there's no repercussions from it. It will benefit me in numerous ways here in Serbia. But anyway, how it came about, you know, I made lots of videos. I'm well known in the diaspora all around the world. And the key reason I think it happened in 2020, there was a Serbian in Australia. This young lady messaged me in university and she said, Charles, uh, listen to this nonsense. She said, in one of my courses, we Serbians, we have a big diaspora here. We had to watch this uh, part of the curriculum in this class, it was talking about genocide and it brought up Slobodan Milosevic, Srebrenica, etc., which she thought was ridiculous that they had to sit and listen to. So I made a video about it. I put the name of the school and the email address and I said, hey folks, this is what's happening in this university in uh, Australia. Serbians are being vilified. Uh, the student body who had nothing to do with any of this nonsense. And I said, message the school. 
a day later, the director sends me an email and says, Charles, please stop this. We've received hundreds upon hundreds of messages. We have removed that curriculum from that course. So please stop this onslaught of messages. So I was able to remove that from the curriculum. So the Serbians didn't have to see it anymore. Well, congrats. Thank you. And the, and the Serbian government, a high level uh, person in the Serbian government reached out to me and said, listen, we know you want our citizenship. I never applied. I had I never applied because I still don't speak the language after 14 years, unfortunately. It's the biggest disgrace. And, and I'm, I'm so embarrassed to say that. Uh, but they reached out. They said, we know you want our citizenship. Uh, we're here to make it happen. And it, the, the scary thing was they knew I was leaving for the USA on like June, uh, what was it, June 12th. So they said, we have six days to get this done. And I thought it was a joke because it was a very high level person in the government. I thought it was just a joke when I received the message. I was in uh, India doing a video on, on Rakia for this guy who makes Rakia. And I get a phone call, this guy on the phone, he's like, Charles Kather, he said, this is the lawyer here at the um, president's office and I'm here to uh, help facilitate this. We need to do this quickly. You need to provide this, 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 this documentation. And I said, wow, perfect. I will get it together immediately. They showed up at my uh, office. I gave them the information. And then the day before I flew out, um, they, uh, they said, hey, meet us at the main police station in Belgrade. I get there, we go inside, the director, he stands up, shakes my hand, says, you're a Serbian citizen, congratulations. And that was such a moving moment. I mean, it sounds cheesy to say that. So many Serbians are like, why do you even care? Who would want this passport? But this, you need to realize, this is a country that I think about, I dream about, I eat here. All my best friends are all Serbian now. This is a country I've promoted and I've loved for years and years and years. And to be given honorary Serbian citizenship, they had a vote on it in the uh, Kokskaji, in the Skupština, whatever. And Ana Brnabic uh, was the, she put her signature on it and I was official thanks to her you know like her love her whatever I don't care but she signed that and it was official and so that would be a good example I, I tell Serbians I say hey listen pretend you go to the USA and a top level person in the in the American government reached out to you and said hey we love what you do for our country promoting this country positively we'd love to honor or to issue you honorary Serbian citizenship or American citizenship, how would you feel? Extremely proud, you know? So it's been a huge moment for me. And how you, you ask another question, you said, how has it negatively affected me? There's zero negativity whatsoever with it, but the positives with it, I've been able to go to Armenia visa-free, I use my passport, uh, I can go to Cuba, uh, Americans cannot go to Cuba uh, unless there is a specific reason. I can go to China visa-free, Russia visa-free. Um, it's less red tape when you open a business. I opened a business here. Less red tape with that. Um, the social care that I can receive from the, the hospitals and things. Opening a bank account. Prior to that, I could not open a bank account here in Serbia because we are one of three countries in the world, America, that we're forced to pay American income tax even if we work abroad. It's ridiculous. But we have to pay the American government when we make money here to our tax, which is lunacy. So anyway, those have been the benefits of it. But the biggest thing, it's not really about having the passport and using it for any benefit. It's just the fact that it's a pride thing, you know. Very proud of it, honestly, you know. I mean, like, you deserved it with I, all of your work. Thank you. Yeah, I, I feel I do. And so many people said that very thing negatively when I posted the video. They're like, why did you get your passport? You shouldn't get this. It's like, you know what? So many of your people, you Serbians in the USA, you stay illegally. You marry some woman for $10,000 and they get a passport. Do they deserve it? No. They did it for giving somebody money. I actually earned it. I feel I earned it. I constantly promote this country. Even when I'm in the USA, I tell people, they say, what do you do year round? You don't work in a bike shop. I said, no, I live in Serbia. I actually received honorary Serbian citizenship. So I constantly am proud and discussing Serbia with every single person I know. Wow. So, yeah. So I'm very proud of it, honestly. It's been a huge achievement, you know.
Steven Seagal, he received honorary Serbian citizenship. So I can say I'm on the same level as him. Yeah, basically. <laughs> he probably threw his away, but I have mine and I use it, you know. So basically for for the end of the of this podcast, we're going to talk about a uh, little little about the states, little little about the Serbia and and beyond and uh for the first thing about that, please um like some people do not believe when we tell them how is like the real life in the USA. So would you mind telling me like showing me how is like the real 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 life working and living in the USA like some good things some bad things and everything around that sure uh, and I, I, I don't want people to take me the wrong way uh, I, I'm very critical about the United States because I see America now when you live in America you see America everywhere even here in Serbia Everything that happens in the USA is broadcasted all over the world. You had to hear all about 9-11. The whole world did. But the whole world didn't hear about our bombing of you in 1999. Nobody even knew it. And so it's so unfair. So I can understand that, that uh, anger that people have. They say, how come American life is worth more than our lives, you know? And I get it, that's a superpower problem. I'm a very proud American, but I'm very critical of the USA when I see it from abroad and what we do. But I'm still very proud. I'm a patriot. I'm a Donald Trump supporter now. I used to be a liberal, but I've totally changed my viewpoint. And I think Trump is the way for a better, stable, uh, more successful uh, country. But when you talk about living in the United States of America, America is very diverse. So I have a little bit more views on America because I've lived in Texas. I've lived in Florida. I've lived in Indiana. I was raised in Illinois most of my life. And I lived in Massachusetts half the year since, uh, pardon me, since 2014. Life in America is what you make it. That's the way I like to put it. America is how much effort you put in. You can succeed, you know. It doesn't matter if you're black, you're white, you're Chinese, you're purple. You come from a poor family in the ghetto. You come from a rich family. Everything you do is what you make it. I have zero sympathy, and this sounds maybe uh, kind of crude and, and cruel, but I have no sympathy for somebody who's poor in the United States of America. Because in the United States of America, if you're poor in the state of Illinois, move over to the state of Massachusetts, work three jobs like my students who can make $25,000 in three months. So many of my Americans, when I talk about how much the students make, people from back in Illinois, in a small little town, they're like, how can your student make $25,000 and have that in their account after three months? They say, I, I have $500 in my bank account. I said, well, these students are working 100 hours a week because they want to. They have drive. They want to work seven days a week. And they're like, oh, well, I don't want to work three jobs. Okay, here of we course. go. Yeah. So fine, be poor. Do your thing. Life in the USA also has its complications. There's crime, massive crime in these big, huge cities. Summer work and travel, thank God, we don't send too many students to the large uh, cities. We send students to San Francisco, Denver, Colorado, Seattle, uh, Los Angeles sometimes, which is not the best. New York City, those are the five biggest. I typically tell students, do not go there. Because we have to keep you, we have to make it affordable. Uh, housing in big cities is not affordable. So we have to put you in an affordable area. And that's typically in the not so safe part of town. So the students are going to be living around homeless, uh, drug addicts, uh, not so great people. They're going to have to commute to work on public transportation. Public transportation in the USA, in comparison to Serbia, uh, you can argue this with me or not, but public transportation in this country is safe, it's clean, it's efficient. In the USA, it's not. I come from a town where I went to, to, my, to that university, was a town of 20,000 people. There's zero public transportation. There's one taxi. There's very, almost no sidewalk. And nobody rides bicycles. So it's very unsafe to ride a bicycle you know, there. Here in Serbia, I've lived here Chetrinais Godina. I don't drive here. I don't need to. There's a 30-minute train 
once every hour to Belgrade. The buses can go to villages. USA, you would never find a bus that can take you to a village of 1,000 people. So America is very vast. It's very big. Certain states are very poor where you're going to work in a, in a hospitality job and make next to nothing. There are states like Massachusetts where the hospitality pays very well. Some of my students are washing dishes for $24 an hour. Uh, which is a great wage in the USA. You go to Illinois or uh, Tennessee, you're going to make this for the same job probably $8, $9 an hour. The federal minimum wage, you know, the USA, we have the federal government and the state governments. The federal minimum wage is still, I think, $7.25 an hour, but each state has different standards, so they raise it. Uh, some states are raising the minimum wage in like big cities to like $20, $22 an hour to work at Walmart, uh, McDonald's. Insanity, in my opinion, because that's going to raise the price of burgers. A company, of course, they're going to pay it, but they're not going to pay it with no repercussions. They're going to raise the price of a Big Mac. So it's just silliness. Uh, but when you, when you look at America, it's a great place, great opportunities. I'm so, so very proud that I happen to have been born in, this, in, in the country, in, in the United States of America, because with my passport, I can go wherever I want. I'm respected. And you can make money wherever you want. If you don't do well in Illinois, move to California, move to Alaska. You have no borders between them. Make it work. You can work two, three jobs. You don't want to. Who does? But you can. You got to do what you got to do. You can open a business easy. Uh, so that's my view on that. When we talk about Serbia, uh, living in Serbia, opening a business here, in my opinion, is a disaster. The taxes here are extremely high. For example, the state of Illinois, our PDV, your equivalent of PDV, is 6.25% yeah. in Illinois. Here, it's 2 right? right? Yeah. 20% PDV. That's insane. Almost three times what we pay in the state of Illinois to buy things. Your Porres for a DOO, I opened a DOO here uh, for three months and I closed it. That Paying the pores on my salary and my people's salary, it's almost 50% I had to pay for taxes on them. USA, it's so much more favorable for business. It took me one month to get this business open. Then I had to open an American uh, bank account, a Euro bank account, a Dinara bank account. I was forced to hire uh, a Rachunara, Caucasus of it. Can yeah. you uh, Can you go with you? Yeah. Da, I, had to, oh, I, had to, I had to do that. I couldn't do it on my own. USA, you can do it on your own. Here you have to. And then anytime I wanted to move, my money came into my American Unicredit account. For me to move that, to use it, I had to get permission from the whatever yeah. so I could move that from the dollar into my Rusad account. And then they screw you two ways. When the money comes from dollar into the dollar, they give you a bad uh, right. rate. Yeah. Then when I move it from my dollar to the other, they give me another bad rate. So I'm losing so much money. And the complications, you have to go here for a stamp, there for a stamp. This, that's... It's so archaic system here for business, I think. But everybody told me it was a mistake to open a DOO. I should have opened like a entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah entrepreneur. it's a pauschalitz. Da, it's yeah. da. They said I should have done that instead, but I went to a lawyer who recommended the DOO. I knew nothing. So I listened to him. The accountant charged me 180, 180 euros a month. All she does is send me a, a, a bill. She says, go pay this. And I thought uh, the point of an accountant is she pays it for me so I don't have to do it. Yeah. She has access to my bank account, but I have to pay it. It's such nonsensical things here. And it's not a business-friendly country uh, for things like that, in my opinion. Uh, the benefits of Serbia. Serbia is a beautiful country with very, very kind people, hospitable people that will treat you. It makes no difference. I, I have friends here that I'm, I'm getting ready to hang out with here in a moment. There are a couple Libyans and a Syrian. There's Muslims here. And so many Muslims around the world, they think Serbia, oh my God, I'm not going to Serbia. They're going to kill me. They hate Muslims. They hate everybody that's not an Orthodox Christian. Nonsense. People are kind, they're interested in you, they're willing to help you. Uh, the food is phenomenal, the lifestyle is great. 
It's still affordable if you have a foreign income, even though the prices every year are going up and up and up and up, it's still a very affordable place to live. It's a very family friendly country uh, that has morality. And that's what I like also. The USA, the morality standards are going down and down and down. They're promoting all these social uh, transgenderism pronouns in, in American schools. Here, you're not gonna find that, you know. Um, not that I have issues with, with, with those folks. They can do whatever they want, but I don't want that stuff in the school system with little kids. They shouldn't learn about it. Uh, here in Serbia, you have morals. You have family-friendly parks that are always full. You go by a park in the USA, it's empty. Here, there's people out. I went to St. Louis, Missouri. It's close to, I'm, I'm closer to St. Louis and Indianapolis than I am to Chicago. I made a few videos from St. Louis. Middle of the day, I'm walking downtown St. Louis. You see hardly nobody on the streets. It's empty. Here in Serbia, Novi Sad, midnight, the streets are full. People walk. That's why you don't see obesity. You see skinny, healthy people. Almost every young person's in sports. They're doing things. Uh, physically, physical fitness, eating a lot better of home-cooked meals uh, and things such as that. So those are the differences, I think. And here in this country, the other negative here, to get a job in this country, even if you're the smartest, smartest of the smart, uh, to get a good job, connections are so critically important. Veza is everything. You know? That's so unfortunate here. So unfortunate. One, one, one situation, which I don't, maybe I shouldn't even uh, bring up, but it, to me, it, it, it uh, sums up that, that whole thing. A girl I used to be with in Zrenjanin, she had phenom she had a PhD. She goes to the Bolnica for an interview for a position. One of the first jobs they, uh, or questions they ask her, it wasn't about her qualifications. It was, which stranka are you with? And she said, none. And they said, well, that can be a problem. What? What kind of question is that to ask somebody that's in medicine? Don't you want the best and the brightest and the most qualified in the medical system? You know? Yes, but from Sick. the specific party. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, yeah, of course. And if it's the wrong party, huh, you're out, you know, sick. You know, but not to trounce and bash that, you know, that happens all over the Balkan. USA too, VESA is important. If you have a good VESA, you're in. You don't, the process is long, drawn out, you know, thank God I have good Veza here. <laughs> so my uh, the things I do is a little bit easier, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I answered those questions appropriately. Yes, you did. Thank you. Good. Yeah. There is a stereotype around the world that the Americans are stupid. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. And why is that even a case? Why, why people like say that? <sighs> you know, I hear that constantly. And you see all these silly little clips on reels on Instagram, um, you know, showing somebody asking America, hey, what's the capital of France or is France a country and you know, these silly things. I think that has been over, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Over exaggerated. America has some of the best universities in the world. We have a lot of very successful folks who are extremely intelligent. But what, maybe, uh, you know, where we lack is geography knowledge. And I think in mathematics and science and those skills like that, when I, as, I, as I was telling you uh, off camera earlier today, I, I know zero of my close friends from my um, high school that have a master's degree. Nobody. I don't know anybody with a PhD in the USA. Here? You've got a master's degree. All my friends have master's degree. I'm probably the dumbest person out of all of them. They're, they're so well-rounded. Here in this country, you can go up to a beautiful girl, stunning, gorgeous, a 10 out of 10, which most of them are here in this country because you have very good genes here. You go up to a beautiful woman. In the USA, you see a, a 10 out of 10 woman. You ask her, her what city she's in, she probably doesn't even know the answer. Uh, I don't know. Here, you can talk to a beautiful woman about politics, about science, about whatever. You have a very broad knowledge. USA, a lot of our school systems are focused very narrow on what you're going to do with your life. You know, we pick our subjects, you focus on that, but they really lack geographical knowledge. And one reason I think, my mother, she worked for the U.S. government, and I don't want to put my mother down. I love my mother with all my heart. But my mother, she couldn't find China on a globe. 
me and my little brother were saying, hey, mom, we spin the globe. Where's China? Now, I don't know where China's at. That's a problem. She worked for the government. You know, but she's an older lady. She's focused on her life, building her family, working, uh, keeping uh, everything paid, etc. And our country's huge. So when Americans, they say that, that that's the other issue. We don't travel outside the USA frequently. Uh, so we don't get a lot of that world knowledge. Why? Because the USA has everything. I'm from the Midwest. It's flat like Voivodina. If we want to go to the beach, we can go to Hawaii or California or Puerto Rico or Florida. If we want to go to the mountains, we go to Denver, Colorado. We want to go to the desert. We go to Nevada, Death Valley. We've got everything there. So Americans go on vacation in America, you know, a lot of times to Mexico, but that's really it. Uh, so I think that is, I think that's uh, not true. I think Americans are smart in their own um, little way, you know. Yeah, I, I received like a lot of comments on my TikTok and uh, in Instagram and like YouTube, like, like you know, don't don't talk about it. Like they're like, stupid and like, how do they know? Like you know, and they also every single time they they point to the geography, like you know, like yeah. they don't know. Like, it's a problem. I mean, like it it kind of is because there is like a reason for that, as you said earlier. So basically, like you have like everything in your backyard, so you don't have to, you don't have a need to go somewhere else. Da, da. Let's say Serbia is like the landlocked country, da. so we don't have like the the sea in our country. If we had, we probably go there. Yeah, you know, da. as Croatian Zoo and the Bosnians as well. You know, Montenegro, yeah. Albania. Da. So yeah, that that's that that that's the thing just behind it that's because true. you have like everything in your country, so you don't have a need. Maybe you have a wish to go, let's say, to China, to sure. I don't know, India, whatever. Sure but you don't have a need for that. Yeah, no, no need. And the other, the other issue with America that I think is just the reason why uh, my biggest regret still to this day, and I get harassed constantly. I was just harassed two minutes ago, for the, or an hour ago before I got here, uh, about not speaking this language yet, Serbian language. And that I blame on our education system in the USA. I graduated high school in 1994. We could not take a foreign language until we're in high school. At that time, I was 17, at what, 15, 16, I played baseball. We, we did zero, I, I took Spanish so I could go to college. You had to have two years of foreign language. But it was niche. To, it was just an American who spoke a little bit of Spanish. Everything was written. I did well, but we never spoke it. So we're not exposed. We, everything we watch in the USA is in English, 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 English. Nobody's going to watch a foreign film ever. You know, I mean, some people do, of course, but the vast majority will not. We're not exposed to that. And so that's why it t still to this day, it's very difficult for me to learn Serbian. And I can cheat here. I can go up to a Serbian. Hey, molim vas dajte mi. And they'll say, just say it in English. And I say, perfect. Give me a banana. <laughs> so it's so easy to cheat here because of the education level of your folks. We should make that a requirement to start learning foreign languages in our elementary school. And I think that would make us more receptive and it'd be easier for us to learn a foreign language. You know. So in Serbia, we mostly learn like the English and uh, we start lear learning Germans, a German language at like... I think 12 years old, 11, yeah. I would say. That's beautiful. Kind of, yeah. But instead of German, I would recommend just to speak the Spanish because there is like 60 million German people living in uh, Germany. And like a lot of people around Europe sp speak that. But there's like a lot more uh, Spanish, Spanish speakers. speakers around no. the world. So no. for us, like the whole South America speaks besides, you know, a little, a few countries. Brazil. And yeah, Brazil. No. And, uh, and other countries. So basically, yeah, like I think it, it would be better for us in terms of the communication with the people around the world. But unfortunately, we as Serbia, as a small country here in the Balkans, we mostly depend on the like bigger countries here in Europe as Germany is, you know, like the France and some other countries. Duh, duh. 
the the other thing I was going to say, just to backtrack slightly, when you ask about life in the USA, uh, life in the USA, something you hear from a lot of Serbian students, and I know hundreds of them. I'm from most of the students who I've been on the program with. I'm still in touch with. I know their mother, their father, their grandma. I go to their Slava. I've really developed a, a family here. You could say with these students, we know each other. We live together. We work together. They're they're my my kids, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but the thing, a lot of these students who sign up for the program, they look at America as a country where money is growing on trees and they can just work a little job and make tons and tons of money. Yes, you can make a lot of money, but you have to put the effort in it. You know, America is not easy. It's expensive. Uh, and it's, it's like I said earlier, it's what you put into this program is what you're going to get out of it. If you have the ability and the, the, energy uh, to work four jobs 100 hours a week you can come back with 30 grand like a lot of my students do they come back buy a car uh, success stories one of my students from Nantucket he made 30 grand he used that money to go to China to study he graduated there now he's working for Porsche China he just got advanced wow. um, so yeah so it's really life-changing experience so I think there's absolutely there's not one single negative that I can think about the summer work and travel program, not one negative thing. And that's difficult to say for, for an American government program. There's usually some, something involved in it. This, I think, is flawless, honestly, you know. Yeah. So My final your, your final word for, for this podcast, well, I have a question for you. So what would you recommend? What would you say to the, to the people that want to go to the, to the summer, summer work and travel program here in Serbia and the, and the other countries in the Balkans as well. Like, what would you recommend? What's your, like, how do you say that? Um, I, I'll, I'll, Recommendations or yeah, basically, locations? What? I mean, like, the when they're going to the States, like, what would you, for the country, for the program, for the jobs, work, people, what would you recommend them? What, what, what would you, what's your message for them? Well, my message for any student who has the ability, anybody who is, is first year, second year, third year, fourth year, PhD, uh, master's year, PhD year, Visoka, Vish, Kakos, Yeah, it's a school, high, higher school. High, higher school. You're all allowed to go on this program. And in my opinion, I would sign up, uh, as I stated, I mean, by no means am I getting anything out of this. But I think if I was a student... This is a life-changing thing. You're going to open your mind. You're going to broaden your mind. You're going to improve your English language. You're going to have a better understanding of Croatians, of Vietnamese people, of Asians, of Mexicans, because you're going to be surrounded with all this diversity here. Uh, you're going to, it's just going to make you a better person. And, you know, it's not all about money. You know, some of you, maybe you're wealthy and you just want the experience. You know, so th the great thing about this, we send students to like 27 different states. Maybe you're a shy person. Uh, maybe you want mountains. You know, there's a place for everybody on this program. If you want beaches, we have it. If you want to make money, I have five or six places I would recommend for that. Uh, some places you're not going to make a lot, but you're going to have a great American experience, you know. And when you come back here, it's going to totally improve your life. It's going to help you build your resume. How many times? It's very important here to have a solid CV. Yeah. When these employers see that you have international work experience, not just international, but in the single greatest capitalistic country in the history of the world, you've worked in the United States. You haven't worked. You didn't work in McDonald's. You worked in an upscale multi-million dollar restaurant or hotel. That says a lot about you. You know, me as somebody who hires lots of people, when I see somebody has international work experience, it tells me a lot of things about you. You have the ability to, you're responsible. You have the ability to live on your own. Own, you know, it's you've gained lots from that. So that tells me things about you that would give me a better uh, reason to hire you as opposed to someone who's never left the Balkan. You know? Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for this interview. My pleasure, sir. Like we talked a lot about like other, you know, topics and everything. We've been through all of this, like, you know, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm speechless, basically. So, Charles, th thank you. Thank you for coming up for the podcast. Thank you for sharing your story about Serbia, sharing your story about the USA, your life and everything. So I hope that the viewers are going to enjoy the, this uh, podcast uh, as well as I did. Well, super. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Take care.